Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. David H. Koch. And Discovering New Knowledge. HHMI. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We're 10 seconds away on take two. Dave Ferrucci is a nervous parent. He spent the last four years building a revolutionary new computer, and it's about to face its biggest test in front of an audience of millions. Hello, my name is Watson. I hope we will have a good game today, but first I have to test my voice. When the cameras roll, the computer called Watson will make history as it competes on the popular quiz show, Jeopardy. Jeopardy! It's frightening, right? I mean, it's, it's a different experience. It's a very different experience for a scientist to sit here and, you know, have this happen live. Six, five, four. Ferrucci has reason to fear. Watson is playing for a million dollar jackpot against the game's toughest competitors. Brad Rutter, Jeopardy's biggest money winner. And Ken Jennings, famous for winning 74 consecutive games. There's some contestants' pride. I want to beat my human competition, but you know, as a species, I would like mankind to, uh, to beat the big bad computer. Let's finish leaders of World War II. All right. This big bad computer is the culmination of four years' intensive work. IBM has put Watson through hundreds of practice games with a stand-in host and real contestants. After Germany invaded the Netherlands, this queen, her family, and cabinet fled to London. Maria. Who is Beatrix? No. Watson, who is Wilhelmina. That is correct. It's a human standing there with their carbon and water versus the computer with all of its silicon and its main memory and its disk. It seems like it should be easy for the computer to win with its enormous memory and processing power. But the human brain makes an intimidating opponent, especially on Jeopardy. Jeopardy questions are tricky. They have puns in them, they have little jokes in them. Just understanding the question is a pretty big deal. This trusted friend was the first non-dairy powdered creamer. Watson? What is milk? <laughs> no. Maria? What is coffee, mate? Thank you. Humans communicate very fluently in you know, natural language, and that's where computers struggle dramatically, right? Now, Watson is on the verge of conquering that challenge. Here we go. A garment worn by a child, perhaps aboard an operatic ship. Watson? What is henna for? <laughs> yes, how did you get that? So, we're gonna be here about if Watson wins on Jeopardy, it will be a major breakthrough in a quest that's gone on for decades. The audacious dream to build a machine as smart as a person. The quest for artificial intelligence, AI. My brain is bigger than yours. When we started doing uh, AI, the goal was, why can't we build a person? We all know how to make people, that's easy. What if we could build one out of silicon? Pioneers drew their inspiration from the world of science fiction. As a child, Isaac Asimov turns up. So here I'm an adolescent, and, and the robots, intelligent machines, are, are a part of my life. Your service. Let's, let's see about getting them built. In the early days, computers grew rapidly more powerful, quickly mastering complex equations. The first programs we wrote at MIT solved problems that only very educated people could solve, like problems in calculus or, and then algebra. The computer pioneers thought they were on a fast track to building human-like intelligence. I confidently expect that within 10 or 15 years, we will find emerging from the laboratories something not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. In the beginning, we thought, well, maybe 10 or 15 years, and we'll have something that's really smart. In the beginning, people really were amazed at how much computers could do. When you see something is improving very fast, you simply assume it will continue improving that fast indefinitely. 
In the 60s, confidence was so high, it inspired one of the most iconic film characters of all time. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. When I was a kid, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Hal was just the best thing ever. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. You know, it was a murdering psychopath. Hal? Hal? But it was intelligent, could talk to people, could see people, could lip read, could do all this stuff. A machine that could do that. And I'd never even seen a real computer at that time. I was mesmerized. I was instantly mesmerized by the character Hal. There's this one part in the movie where one of the actors in the movie is sketching quietly. And Hal asks him, Have you been doing some more work? A few sketches. May I see them? He says, oh, I'm sketching. And he says, can you show me the sketch? And he holds it up. Sure. Can you hold it a bit closer? That's when I got goosebumps, because that's such a human thing to say. I think you've improved a great deal. And I said, this is wonderful. What does it take? What does it take to build something like this? Bishop takes night's ball. More than 40 years after the creation of HAL, no one has answered that question. No real computer or robot has been able to interact with humans as seamlessly as Hollywood imagines. Tell me, what is love? The problem is our own human computer, the brain, a complex entity that's defied any attempts at replication. We just had no idea how sophisticated the brain was. The computer has always been king when it comes to calculation and processing huge amounts of data. Pen is in the pen. What's the middle letter? E. e. Excellent. But simple skills that humans master early in life, like understanding language or recognizing objects, continue to baffle researchers. You know, people uh, vastly misjudged how subtle we are when we're intelligent. People just hugely underestimated that. But the dream of building a computer that could talk and match wits with humans never really died. And a few years ago, a new plan was hatched, sparked by an unlikely event. This is Jeopardy! In Wagner's operas, this eldest Valkyrie is stereotypically dressed in a horned helmet and breastplate. Ken. Who's Brunhilde? Correct. In 2004, Ken Jennings' 74-game winning streak on Jeopardy set the country abuzz and caught the eye of an IBM executive while out to dinner. All of a sudden, the entire restaurant cleared out to the bar that I'm sitting at to go see Ken Jennings. This grand old Opry comedy star used to wear a straw hat with the $1.98 price tag still attached. Ken. Who's Minnie Pearl? Minnie Pearl. Howdy. Funny hats for you. Charles Licker wondered if a computer could ever play as well as Ken Jennings. So he pitched the idea to some of IBM's top scientists. For the ones that knew Jeopardy, they said, sure, that's just too hard. I think the, the prevailing view was, um, you know, th these questions were, were difficult to understand, difficult to even comprehend what was being asked. Yeah, I was like, no way. I was like, no way. But one researcher, Dave Ferrucci, was intrigued. My view was, maybe this isn't as completely impossible as we think it is. And now... For over 40 years, Jeopardy! has been pop culture's IQ test. Clues are given as answers and contestants have to respond in the form of a question. Mother's 1600. It's a larger vessel that guards and supplies smaller ones. Christina. Was a mothership? Mothership, yes. And mother the show Central Conceit is a little syntactic reversal whereby they give you an answer and you supply a question. You don't say, George Washington, you say, who is George Washington? To win, contestants need to be human encyclopedias. Because it's essentially everything under the sun. First in this round. You know the categories at the same second Alex tells the folks at home the category. One, you have to have a broad knowledge because we have 13 categories on each show. Kate, start. Uh, pH for 400. For the record, Thomas Edison invented the first practical one of these in 1877. Contestants also have to be fast. Ariel. What is the phonograph? Good. They typically have three seconds or less to come up with an answer. The mortar and pestle is a symbol of this profession. Ariel. What is a pharmacist? Pharmacist is right. To compete on Jeopardy, IBM's computer must have an enormous knowledge base because it will not be connected to the internet. But the far bigger challenge for the machine will be understanding clues, which can be extremely convoluted or obscure. 
You'll find this flower before pickle bottom in a line of handbags and bedding. And that would be petunia. Back to you, Ariel. There will be a lot of puns. There will be uh, double meanings. You know, and these were things the computers historically are terrible at. Human language is a minefield for computers. Consider this sentence. How's it go? I shot an elephant uh, wearing my pajamas. Was I wearing the pajamas? Was the elephant wearing the pajamas? Right. So there's different interpretations, different ways to parse the sentence. The word shot, you know, what, what, what's really going on there? There's already ambiguity in there. It could actually be shooting, sort of a hunting shooting. If I'm a photographer and I'm immersed in that context, I may interpret that as shooting with a camera. Which one did I mean? So you have to look at the context. But a computer has no context. It's just an electronic brain in a box. In 2006, Ferrucci tackles this challenge, along with the best and brightest programmers from IBM and the country's top AI labs. The way we solve this is actually... To start, they run a test. We had an um, existing state-of-the-art system that people had worked on for a number of years, and we tried applying that to the Jeopardy challenge. They feed one of IBM's most sophisticated computer programs hundreds of Jeopardy questions, like this one. In 1698, this comet discoverer took a ship called the Paramore Pink on the first purely scientific sea voyage. The correct answer is who is Edmund Haley. The computer says, who is Peter Sellers? The computer ran a search through a million documents, looking for key words from the clue. It homed in on a description of one of the Pink Panther films, in which one character was a paramour, or mistress. The star of the movie? Peter Sellers. It's probably the last answer a human would come up with, but it's typical for computers. The team has a long way to go. Just how far becomes clear when they compare the computer to the best human players. They create a graph called the cloud. Each dot represents a Jeopardy! champion's performance. Jennings is at the top. What you see is a cloud that's around, they answer around 50%, the winners do, and they get around 90% correct. And where is the computer in this cloud? If we asked it to answer all the questions, it would be 10% of the questions right. You can't go on Jeopardy! like that. I mean, the best humans, they're 90%, 92%. We weren't even close. To win at Jeopardy!, the team will need a whole new way to tackle human language, one that takes advantage of the computer's basic strengths. At its electronic core, a computer speaks a very simple language, binary code, on or off. But with that simple code, it can follow instructions and solve complex problems, once reserved for intellectual giants. It used to be the case that intelligence was chess, right? If you can play chess, that's intelligence. Computers have mastered the game. Chess is easy for computers because the rules are very well defined and very clear. The rules of chess are relatively simple, a board of 64 squares. Each piece, pawn, knight, queen, can move a certain way. And there's a single goal, take out your opponent's king. For humans, it is the ultimate game of strategy. The way computers play chess is not at all the way people play chess. We humans look at the board and have conceptual ideas like control the center, attack on the right. Very different from the way computers play chess. A chess playing computer looks at virtually every possible move it could make and every response, every way the game could play out. Computers play chess through searching a tree of moves down to a very deep level, looking ahead on every possible path, but they do it by brute force, by going 20, 30, 40 moves ahead and seeing all the bad things that can happen. A person can't look that many moves ahead broadly. This is the power behind the most famous chess game in the history of AI, when in 1997, another IBM computer named Deep Blue beat the reigning world champion, Gary Kasparov. The chess world champion walked away from the match, never looking back at the computer that just beat him. The victory makes Deep Blue look pretty smart. But is it? 
deep blue. It's only acting as if it's intelligent. It's not really intelligent in the way that we humans are. It's good at one thing, it's playing chess. It can't do anything else. There's no other understanding in the world. It's just about chess moves. This lack of understanding has hampered every computer program that's tackled human language. A perfect example is a program from the 1960s called ELIZA. ELIZA was one of the first programs that had anything resembling human conversation. It was a dialogue. You type things in and type things back. How do you do? Please tell me your problem. I'm feeling sad. Then it types back. Did you come to me because you're feeling sad? Eliza was programmed to respond like a psychiatrist, but it had no real insight. Instead, it followed simple rules and rearranged key phrases. So if I say, I'm dead, it responds, do you enjoy being dead? It doesn't have any understanding that dead is a different kind of condition. It really is just doing this sort of fill in the blanks kind of pattern matching. Anyone who tried to solve the language problem hit the same brick wall, the computer's profound ignorance of what we take for granted every day. There's just so much more that we know that we don't know we know. I mean, just we know all kinds of stuff, like you press the up button in the elevator, that means it's going to go up, or milk is white, or water is wet. I mean, it's just stuff that we know that we don't even realize we know. That's one of the things that makes it hard. All the common sense knowledge a human brain collects naturally seems much too complex to program into a computer. But that hasn't stopped one scientist from trying. So we have actually manually entered about six million rules. That's about 3% of what it's going to need to know in terms of actually spanning what you and I would call human common sense. For the last 25 years, Doug Lanat has been leading a team trying to create human-like intelligence by teaching a computer common sense, rule by rule. The program is called Psych, and at headquarters, the walls are covered with logic diagrams. In a way, the, the, the magic of this, the power of this, is if you just tell it each rule one by one by one, and you give it general logical reasoning capabilities, that's all you need to do. So far, Psych has six million rules and can answer a lot of common sense questions, like this one. Can a can, can, can. Psych says no, and it explains why. Here, it's essentially saying the, the reason why cans can't can can um, is that cans are inanimate objects, and it knows that can can dancing requires at least partially having a brain and using it. It's just enough for Psych to get the right answer for the right reason. 25 years ago, many experts considered rules and logic the best hope for building artificial intelligence. But it's become clear these alone are not enough. It's not just a matter of piling in more and more stuff. There are basic principles that we didn't understand. Putting in more and more stuff doesn't get you basic principles. At IBM, as Dave Ferrucci and his team tackle the Jeopardy challenge, they know that facts and rules are just the beginning. We couldn't write rules for every combination of word and phrases and context. They need a new system, more fluid and flexible, to navigate the twists and turns of many different kinds of Jeopardy questions. They named their system Watson, after IBM founder Thomas Watson. The electronic Watson consists of 2,800 processors. That's like 6,000 high-end home computers. Altogether, it's the size of 10 refrigerators. The team starts filling his memory banks with about 10 million documents, most downloaded from the internet. Because when Watson plays Jeopardy, he must stand alone, just like his human competitors. All kinds of content, okay, encyclopedias, dictionaries, thesauri, books, plays, you name it. The entire World Book Encyclopedia, Wikipedia, the Internet Movie Database, much of the New York Times archive, and the Bible are just some of Watson's resources. And to build on Watson's foundation of data and rules, 
the team turns to a powerful tool in the computing world. It's called machine learning. Machine learning is just like human learning from examples. Before, people would just write rules, write rules by hand. Nowadays, it's all based on examples. To understand how machine learning works, consider for a moment the letter A. What if you had to describe it to a computer? It's a real problem faced by the U.S. Postal Service, whose computers must decipher all kinds of addresses, printed and handwritten. We all know what an A looks like. I know when I see it, but there's just way too many different types of A's. There are fonts where the A is just a triangle pointing up. Right? That, that's an A. Pretty quickly you realize there is no simple set of rules that you can write down currently for a program to determine whether a letter is an A or not. Humans might not be able to come up with the rules that reliably identify all kinds of A's, but it turns out a computer can do it for itself, if you give it enough examples. The way you do it is you just get an A, send it to the program and say, that's an A. Here's another A, different one, that's an A. Here's another A, it's a different one, that's an A. Then you would give it another example, then you would give it another example, and you would do that a million times. The computer hunts for patterns among all those examples, and it finds them. So the next time it meets a letter A, even one it hasn't seen before, it will recognize it. This is machine learning, and it's a crucial element of Watson's programming. The team trains Watson. But here, instead of letters, the examples are tens of thousands of old Jeopardy questions, along with a cheat sheet of all the correct answers. Using machine learning, Watson will hunt for patterns between the type of question, the correct answer, and the kinds of evidence that support that answer. Now, we do this over thousands of questions, so we come up with some way to weigh the evidence on average so that we come up with the right answer. Now, when he's faced with a brand new question, Watson uses what he learned from these patterns and declares his confidence in each possible answer. In the end, we get a list that says, here's the top answer, and we're 75% sure it's right. Watson has now become a complex architecture of rules, raw data, and machine learning that enables him to use statistics to choose the right answer. To test out this system, the team scours the halls for IBM employees who can play Jeopardy. And everyone squeezes in to a conference room. In 1978, New Jersey Monthly reporter Stephen Levy famously found this man's brain. Watson. What is it? Einstein's? Albert Einstein's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Fifth Amendment says that private property shall not be taken for public use without this. Watson. What is just compensation? Yes. With this new system, Watson surges into the winner's cloud. We took a huge jump with machine learning. Watson with a commanding lead, 24,863. We saw a huge jump in performance, and we were like, woo! Up to now, appearing on the TV show has only been a dream. But Watson is performing so well, Dave Ferrucci decides it's time to call Jeopardy. In December 2009, Jeopardy! producers arrive at IBM to size up Dave Ferrucci's new creation. Like any human contestant, Watson must audition to earn his spot on the show. You spent all this time, you know, developing this system and, and, and pushing its capabilities. Then here you are, sitting here, all the executives are there. You hear computer, you think, uh, well, of course, a computer should have all the answers. You hear about Q&A technology. Well, isn't this just a big search engine? And they're waiting to see, you know, what really is going to happen. And you just don't know. You don't know. To impress the executives, IBM builds a makeshift studio, hires comedian Todd Crane to act as game show host, and brings in former TV contestants. That was one of the tensest days I've ever had, <laughs> because we had never seen it play against Jeopardy players. Select again, David. And uh, I remember, like, the day before, you know, we're tuning everything. You know, I was putting in the best strategy that we had. I was putting in the best stuff that we had. And I thought, well, this is just going to kill him. Miranda. What is the cat's in the cradle? That is correct. Is this I am the walrus? Yes. What is crocodile rock? Yes. You know, they were just, like, professional athletes. 
it was a really tough few games for us. In the first round, it seems that Watson is auditioning not for a game show, but a sitcom. Where do we go next? L underscore 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 from one thousand. There are suddenly unexpected bugs that need fixing. We weren't dealing with Roman numerals well, so it'll say like Henry V. We would say Henry V. In 1682, he came to the throne at the age of 10, along with his weak-minded half-brother, Ivan V. Watson? What is Peter? More specific? What is Peter I? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Mm. Carrie or David? Carrie? Who is Peter the Great? That is correct. Peter the In Final Jeopardy, where contestants must place bets and write down the answer, things only get worse. No. Yeah. Under the category flags, the clue is, in a policy begun in 2002 as a symbol of the war on terrorism, U.S. Navy ships fly the 18th century flag with this four-word motto. You know a little bit something about 18th century flags. David, let's see if you did. <clears throat> what is the four-word motto we're looking for, David? What is don't tread on me? That is correct. Let's see if Watson got it right. <laughs> what is September 11th? Oh, oh. Watson didn't recognize the word motto, and after scanning through millions of documents, he found the word terrorism associated with September 11th so frequently. That seemed like the best answer. By the time they break for lunch, it's humans too, Watson zero. And it's not clear if Watson will ever be ready for primetime. This was taking a risk for me in the sense that you're sitting here and saying, you know what, I think this is possible. And then you fall flat on your face and people say, well, we're never gonna believe Ferrucci again. Did I expect to get fired? No, but maybe. <laughs> but after lunch, the producers are treated to a different side of Watson. We came back and the third game was neck and neck, incredibly competitive. In act three of an 1846 Verdi opera, this scourge of God is stabbed to death by his lover, Odabella. Watson? What is Attila? Be more specific? What is Attila the Hunt? Thank you very much, Attila the Hunt, I'll take that. That afternoon, Watson climbs back in the game. Wordsworth said they soar, but never roam. This Brit, wrote, Watson? East is east. What is Skylark? That is correct. It's a device clamped to the wheel of a parked car with overdue tickets. That is correct. Watson? What is boot? Be more specific. What is Denver boot? That is correct. This African-American folklore laborer, before I let that steam drill beat me down, I'll die with my hammer in my hand. Watson? What is John Henry? That is correct. Select again, Watson. It may appear that Watson has redeemed himself, but the producers are troubled by his erratic performance. Their verdict, Watson isn't strong enough for Jeopardy. At least, not yet. Why is Watson so erratic? To understand his weaknesses, you have to appreciate the complexity of the task. Consider this clue. Keanu Reeves had a Nokia phone but it took a landline to slip in and out of this, the title of a 1999 sci-fi flick. The correct response is what is the matrix? But how can Watson figure that out? First, he breaks down the clue into grammatical parts, identifying key words and phrases. Then, Watson's powerful search engines churn through millions of documents, including the Internet Movie Database. What we do next is we take these documents and we pull out candidate answers. And we'll pull out, okay, Keanu Reeves. That could be a candidate. We'll pull out Nokia. We'll pull out The Matrix. Other movies starring Keanu Reeves also become possible answers. We'll pull out The Matrix 2. We'll pull out Speed, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, all this stuff. Whoa. And Watson pulls out other famous sci-fi flicks, like Blade Runner. And it generates hundreds of possible answers. With hundreds of choices, how can Watson pick the one answer that's correct? Next thing that Watson is gonna do is gonna take those answers and say, well, let's assume all of them might be right. So these are its competing hypotheses. Watson starts considering evidence for and against each candidate, using rules like a movie is sometimes called a flick. And we'll look at things like, well, it's looking for a flick. Is this candidate answer a flick? Is the matrix a flick? Yes. Is speed a flick? Yes. Is Keanu Reeves a flick? No. Right, so we're starting to learn something. Within a matter of milliseconds, Watson analyzes every possible answer, 
in hundreds of different ways and scores each piece of evidence behind every answer in the list. That's a lot of scores. The problem is you have all these different scores and they don't agree. You know, some of the scores are going to say the matrix is the right answer. Some of the scores are going to say Keanu Reeves is the right answer. Some are going to think matrix two is the right answer. And a lot of scores think Blade Runner is the right answer because it shows up so often as a sci-fi flick. So you need someone at the end to listen to all these different votes and decide what's going to be the best answer. This is where Watson's machine learning kicks in. Having studied thousands of other Jeopardy questions and their correct answers, Watson has learned what evidence is important and what's not. What machine learning will start to do is learn how to weigh them differently and say, well, hey, questions like this, calling on a phone, not calling on a phone, not so important. Um, this other stuff, do I have a sci-fi movie? Is the person named, the character in that movie? Very, very important for questions like this. In this case, he successfully weighs the evidence and identifies sci-fi flicks from 1999, starring Keanu Reeves. So he picks the one answer matching all those elements, The Matrix. Watson's elaborate system doesn't always work, but without machine learning, he wouldn't stand a chance. Machine learning isn't just important for Watson. It's driving a revolution in computing. It plays a major role in computer models that predict the weather days in advance. And all those recommendations you get from Amazon or Netflix, no human is writing up rules about your likes and dislikes. Instead, computers are comparing your preferences to millions of other customers and finding patterns and learning about you. Today, machine learning is conquering many problems once thought too complex for computers, like speech recognition. In the earlier days, people decided that they would try to program computers to recognize speech. Which word am I saying now? Pick up the big block at the right side. In the 60s, this voice-directed block world was the height of technology. Computers could be programmed to recognize the audio signals of specific words and phrases. Pick up every small block. But they had to be reprogrammed for every new speaker because everyone's speech is slightly different. Even though it's very easy for you and I to recognize the word ice cube, ice cube. it's very difficult for us to write down the rules that would allow a computer to look at the microphone signal and see that it's ice cube. Ice cube. But now, computers are trained with millions of examples of human speech. Here's a microphone signal, and this is the word ice cube. Ice cube. Here's another one. Ice cube. You end up with much more successful speech recognition systems. Today, speech recognition software, though not perfect, is remarkably accurate and getting better all the time. All the ones we have today are based on machine learning simply because it works the best. And some programs are taking it a step further. Where do you come from? Not only transcribing your speech, Shanghai. but translating it into a foreign language as well. Shanghai. It's very nice to meet you. Every language has so much ambiguity, double meanings and metaphors. What are your specials today? Accurate computer translation seemed impossible with the old rules-based approach. Today's special is roast beef fried rice. All of these interactions are so complex that you couldn't, in your lifetime, write all these rules. It's just too enormous, too daunting an effort. My wife asked me to buy some crackers. Donna cracker desu ka? Rice crackers. Alex Weibel fed a computer millions of examples of English text, together with their translations into about a dozen different languages. Now he's got a program that can run on your phone or iPad. Do you often go shopping here? And translates on the go. Machine learning has been so successful mastering more and more tasks once only done well by humans. The computer program translates between languages. Some researchers believe it may be a crucial building block for making real artificial intelligence. There are two ways of building intelligence. You either know how to write down the recipe or you let it grow itself. 
and it's pretty clear that we don't know how to write down the recipe. Machine learning is all about giving it the capability to grow itself. Some people find the idea of a machine that can learn threatening. But when Watson's having a bad day, it's hard to imagine him threatening anyone. Daily Double? Yeah. yeah. So we were way ahead. We were almost locking out. Another Daily Double! We get the Daily Double. There's like two or three clues left. And so what do we do? We bet big so we can lock them out. I'll wager $5,200. <laughs> the team is nervous. They know Watson will never make the cut on Jeopardy unless he can stop making dumb mistakes. Here's your clue. It was about letters and it was a woman wrote to this one. Why are we here wrong? Artist. In the late 40s, a mother wrote to this artist that his picture, number nine, looked like some of her son's finger painting. We answer with Rembrandt. Who is Rembrandt? Oh, ah. very bad. Really? Although Watson recognizes most dates, he doesn't know that the 40s refer to the 1940s. And Michael Crowe. a 40s artist, we answer with Rembrandt. It was a, there's a time, a time problem. We all know that it was Jackson Pollock. Watson loses that game. We got the double wrong and found it. And his opponents show him no mercy. We both beat him. Good for you. <laughs> Humans. Woo! Sometimes the reason something is the right answer is very obvious to a human. Like, for example, it may be asking for a she or a he. This first lady was born Thelma Catherine Ryan on March 16th, 1912 in Nevada. Watson? Who is Richard Nixon? <laughs> Oh, here you go. Right? Patricia? <laughs> Who is Pat Nixon? That is correct. Richard Nixon was never a first lady. <laughs> we, I want to understand what it went on. Our new, our new gender stuff well, is not in stuff this should, system. Should, yeah, it's not in this system. <laughs> to my knowledge. People take offense at being called the wrong gender. Watson doesn't care about stuff like that. It's making statistical judgments based on how different pieces of evidence have gone together in questions and answers that we've given it. The two famous comedians' noses that made impressions. What is Jimmy Durante? More specific? Sorry, all I know is what is Jimmy Durante. <laughs> <laughs> Saying it slower doesn't make it right. Um, <laughs> now you hear how Todd Crane makes fun of the computer. And I, you know, I had my, my kids, I had them sign the confidentiality agreement and come in and see a couple of these games. And you know what their comment was, why does the host make fun of Watson, Daddy? This What Are You Doing website's name also refers to a type of nervous laugh. Watson? What is evil laugh? Oh, no. <laughs> in terms of comedy duos, he is the best straight man in the business. You're going to kick yourself Twitter. Because he doesn't, oh, Twitter. he doesn't get it. He doesn't get why his, uh, his inappropriate answer is funny. And that's, there's, you can't, you can't ask for better writing than that. <laughs> And once in a while, okay, we could all take a joke, but over and over again. And Watson's defenseless, right? So he's, he's, he's making fun of and criticizing a defenseless computer that represents people with real feelings, real families. Or maybe if I don't have any feelings, my kids have feelings. And feelings are intensified by the fact there's just one more month before the Jeopardy! producers will return to make a decision. Watson, you have control. The pressure is on to boost Watson's strengths and eliminate his weaknesses. His strengths are obvious. He dominates when it comes to purely factual questions. Watson usually does very well at these factoid questions, looking up facts, you know, history, geography, entertainment. Clark Gable was happy to see him come in and finish directing Gone with the Wind. Watson? Who is Victor Fleming? That is correct. Watson, you choose again. For 1600 please. His westerns include Wagon Master and Ford Apache. Watson. Who is John Ford? Good for 1600 Who is Mike Nichols? Good for 12 Last clue on the board for $800. Here it is. Revenge of, in 1978, was the fifth in this series of comedies directed by Blake Edwards. Watson. What is the Pink Panther? I just want to check. Your buzzers are working. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to, wanted to check in and wake you from your nap. Yeah, right. uh, Watson has made it into the clown, but nowhere near championship level. Ferrucci must come up with a plan to somehow step up his performance before the Jeopardy! producers return. The team has spent almost four years, enormous intellectual and emotional energy, 
and tens of millions of dollars on developing Watson. But all this effort isn't just for a machine that can play Jeopardy. IBM has much bigger goals. I'm already looking sort of beyond Jeopardy. I'm thinking, where can we go from here? Ferrucci imagines a day when Watson might perform much like the computer in Star Trek. The captain just starts talking to the computer and they say, computer. Computer. Ready. Could a storm of such magnitude cause a power surge in the transporter circuits? It's an information seeking tool that's capable of understanding your question, creating a momentary interdimensional contact with a parallel universe. And dialoguing with you to make sure that you get what you want. Affirmative. We, do you have one of those? I, 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 I don't have one of those, right? You don't need to be a starship commander to find this helpful. In a world overflowing with data, intelligent expert systems that can answer vital questions have been the holy grail. Now, we could be close to a Watson MD. Think of it this way. There's a bunch of information, new diagnosis, new treatment options, new discoveries. Can anybody keep that all in their head all at once? A machine that could access and organize all that information could help doctors analyze symptoms and wade through piles of medical journals. It changes the paradigm in which we work with computers. That's the vision. How am I doing? I hope we will have a good game today, but first I have to test my voice to make Before sure that vision can be fulfilled, before Watson can even compete on Jeopardy, the team needs to get more bugs out of his system. One of Watson's most embarrassing weaknesses is he cannot hear. Instead, Watson receives each Jeopardy clue as an electronic text message at the same moment his competitors see it on the board. As a result, he doesn't know the other contestants' answers. Only the female of this equine pest of the family, Tabinidae, feeds on blood. The male feeds on nectar. Bill? What's a mosquito? No. Watson? What is mosquito? <laughs> no. Harvey? What's a horsefly? Yes, thank you for not saying mosquito. <laughs> Good job. Good for $2,000, Harvey. <laughs> Ferrucci and the team have been working furiously to boost Watson's performance. As part of their plan, Watson will now receive correct answers electronically after they're revealed. If the fix works, it will be in the nick of time. The Jeopardy! producers are back, and they're about to determine Watson's fate. You know, this was a measure of our progress, and we wanted to hear, yeah, you're there, you've made it. The new and improved Watson gets his first big test with a category called Celebrations of the Month. Administrative Professionals Day and National CPA's Goof Off Day. Watson? What is holiday? No, that's not even close, really. Watson fails because he doesn't get that in this category, the answer must be the name of a month, something his human competition quickly figures out. Arthur? What is April? What is April? April 18th is National. I don't understand why we're... We don't understand the question. I don't understand why. We don't understand the category. D-Day anniversary and Magna Carta Day. But now, he electronically receives these correct responses. Arthur. What is June? Good for 200. Can he learn from the answers? National what Watson does here is it sees that, well, all the answers I've seen have been the month in which this thing in the clue occurs. Matt. What is November? Good for four. So then it knows in the next clue to look for um, what month does this, this thing occur in? Uh, celebrations for six. Celebrations for six. National Teacher Day and Kentucky Derby Day. Watson. What is May? Yes, we got it. Very nicely done, Watson. <laughs> you figured it out. Yeah. It took us four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks to the team's efforts, Watson is soaring higher in the cloud and now approaching the level of champions like Ken Jennings. Watson is on a roll. Choose again. You're tripping. For 1600. <laughs> Jacques Cartier found this largest island of the Hokalaga Archipelago while searching for gold. Watson. What is Montreal? Yes. Who is Zebulon Pike? Good. What is Providence? Aquarius, Texas. Beau Rommel. Watson. What is Chow? That was right and acute all at the same time. <laughs> the Jeopardy executives have seen enough. <laughs> I think we've gone from impressed to blown away. Very nicely done, Watson. <laughs> Finally, Watson will get his chance on Jeopardy. A computer playing against human champions. They say it can think. In a game that is a very symbol of intelligence. 
But can it think like a Jeopardy champion? It will be a contest the world has never seen. Good luck, Watson. But does this mean that the dream of artificial intelligence is coming true? So artificial intelligence, to me, is trying to get computers to do stuff that if people did them, you'd say, oh, they're demonstrating their peopleness. That's what makes humans humans. That's stuff they're doing. But without experience or emotion, can a computer like Watson ever learn and understand the world the way we humans do from early childhood on? Right now, no machine can understand the meaning of a play, or what, it, what it means to be King Lear or Macbeth or Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. No machine can understand the parables in the Judeo-Christian Bible. All they can do is grubble through data and find regularities. But for Dave Ferrucci, that kind of understanding was never the goal. It's not going to emerge as a, as a human, because it doesn't connect the information to human experience, to human cognition. When you think about um, a great symphony, and when a human sits down with that, that music is affecting that human at an emotional level. The computer doesn't have that human experience, doesn't have that human emotion, it's not human, it's a computer. Watson may never experience the world the way we do, but with his enormous knowledge base, his skill at interpreting language, and his ability to learn. Yes, we got it. What is that? You can figure that out. Could he actually be considered intelligent? Oh my God, it is more intelligent than the average Jeopardy player in, in, in answering Jeopardy questions. That's impressively intelligent. The time has come for Watson to take the stage, where his intelligence will be put to the ultimate test in front of millions of Jeopardy viewers. Am I having fun? Yeah. It's nerve-wracking. For the big match, Watson now has a physical presence, an avatar. My name is Watson. How now, brown cow? The team has been working right up till the end. I think I dream about Jeopardy questions now. I have nightmares about Jeopardy questions. I talk to people in the form of a question. Have they done enough? They're about to find out as Watson meets the world's two best Jeopardy players, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings. We've never had this caliber of a player. And there's a reason why Ken won 74 games in a row. There's a reason why Brad has never been beat by a human. The whole team has been waiting four years for this moment. I knew this was gonna happen, but I never imagined quite like this. What do you say we play Jeopardy? With another stand-in host, Watson meets his opponents for an exhibition round. Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400 same category. This mystery author and her archeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Watching from the wings is Jeopardy's host, Alex Trebek. He doesn't get everything right, but he doesn't miss very much. Watson? Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. <laughs> At Mount Carmel in Israel, Dorothy Garad was the first to find this prehistoric human skeleton outside of Europe. Ken, what is Neanderthal? You're right. By the end of this 10-minute game, man and machine are neck and neck, and no one dares predict what will happen when they face off in the looming showdown. Um, MC5 or two. It's gonna be edge of your seat, it's gonna be nerve-wracking. What really is gonna happen? And you just don't know. You don't know. I suspect that this will just be the jumping off point. Their next project will be we don't want to create an avatar that will play as a contestant on Jeopardy. We want to create the host of Jeopardy. And they can do it. Good afternoon, Mr. Trebek. I've been waiting for this moment for a very, very, very long time. The exploration continues on Nova's website, where you can find a Q&A with Watson team leader David Ferrucci. 
see other smart machines transforming our world, and hear what top computer scientists have to say about the future of artificial intelligence. Dig deeper into technology and engineering with expert interviews, interactives, teacher resources, and more. Follow Nova on Facebook and Twitter, and find us online at pbs.org. Next time on Nova, in stormy skies, more than 300 miles from land, Flight 447 plummets into the sea. Almost unheard of series of failures, one right behind the other. Nova and a team of independent investigators unravel the mystery of what went wrong. We need to understand what happened that night out over the Atlantic. The crash of Flight 447, next time on Nova. Major funding for Nova is provided by David H. Koch and Discovering New Knowledge. HHMI. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This Nova program is available on DVD at shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.